Pre-code horror, it's the real deal, folks. The scourge of parents and subcommittees everywhere. This stuff was so strong that they banned it. But like any self-respecting monster, pre-code horror refuses to lie down and die. Ah, uh, but why take my word for it when I can show you? Good evening, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your ghost, Jason Mink. As we all know, comics in the 1950s had gotten a little spicy. Depictions of crime, drug use, and debauchery had slowly sidled into our funny books, and nowhere was this more apparent than the popular horror comics of the day. Gone were the classic but toothless ghosts and spooks, replaced by drooling ghouls, axe-wielding maniacs, and more undead spouses than you could shake a stake at. This angered and alarmed both parents and clergymen, and before we knew it, we were shielded from these gory horrors by the seemingly impenetrable comics code. The code forbid depictions of horror, sex, and extreme violence, making the comics of just a few months before impossible to produce. And while the medium soldiered on, it would be almost two decades before horror could return to the newsstand in any appreciable form form. And while what came after was pretty great, today we're going to focus on the before. That's right, the same folks who brought you Herbie Popnecker are responsible for this little gem. In our first torrid tale, The Puppet Show, uh, we experienced the patented ACG True Vision. This was the company's attempt at replicating the effect of the popular 3D comic without including those pesky and expensive to produce glasses. The popular program, The Puppet Show, concludes another successful broadcast, but behind the scenes, trouble is brewing. While the show is a big hit, the viewers are only aware of the puppet's creator, the legendary Joe Hathaway. The man who operates the puppets, Ombrini, is left in the shadows. After the show, Ombrini smells fumes and rushes down to the workshop of his partner, who has succumbed to gas from melted plastic. Using this as cover, Umbrini kills Hathaway and drops his body into the fireplace in an attempt to make the death look like an accident. Yikes! As Umbrini enacts his wicked plan, there's a commotion. The puppets have begun to move by themselves, spelling out the murdered man's name with their segmented bodies. Umbrini understandably shaken, tries his best to stop their chattering, smashing them up pretty good in the process. Spent, he passes out after shoving the rest of his partner into the giant fireplace. However, Joe's ghosts manifests from the smoke and taunts Umbrini. Umbrini runs. To his horror, he discovers the puppets he destroyed earlier have been repaired by their fellows, and they're pissed! Ombrini is trussed up and dragged into the rafters, where he's further tormented by Joe's ghost. Lashing out, Ombrini manages to kick one of the murderous marionettes into the fire, but it takes more than that to stop segmented vengeance. The burning puppet escapes, the fire knocks a bottle of solvent over, and the whole place goes up in flames, with Joe and his friends seemingly headed off to greener pastures. Pretty freaky, huh? <laughs> Illustrated by Harry Lazarus, The Puppet Show is a nasty bit of business sure to please fans of the weird and uncanny. The True Vision presentation is a cool concept, uh, led down a bit by the printer's inability to get consistent blacks. Uh, I've seen the same technique used on covers to much better effect. 
Next up, a non-True Vision story in the form of The Family Tree of Samuel Dawes. Carolyn brings her boyfriend a creepy old painting from an estate sale. Oddly enough, the painting bears her boyfriend's name, and the two conjecture that the artist is one of Sammy's long-lost relatives. Before you can say, well, I'm certainly no genealogist, but that seems highly unlikely, the two are winging their way to the scenic Balkans to track down the source of their little mystery. They hit the bullseye soon enough, finding a charming little village full of suspicious peasants who dread the name Doze, and who tell the two to beat it. Before they can, Sam is compelled by some unseen force to leave his hotel room. A coach waits outside, which whisks him to a dark and sinister house. Within wait a group of freaked-out weirdos who look all the world like Dan Clow's drawings. Sam is taken before the wizened patriarch, the first Samuel Doze, now an ancient vampire. Frightened, young Sam exits stage left, screaming all the way back to the hotel to snag Carolyn and wing it back to the States. Ah, and here's a helpful stagecoach driver to help them to the airport. Only surprise. There's no such thing as a helpful stagecoach driver. As we saw in our last episode with Dr. Spector, these guys are always out to do you. Sam and Carolyn are taken back to the Doe's Manor, where the thinkable happens. It's muy predictable, but hey, they can't all be about murderous puppets, now can they? American Comics Group would publish 174 issues of Adventures into the Unknown, making it the company's longest-running title. Thank you to Bump Hinnershits for donating this great book to the old guys who like old comics archives. Cheers, my friend. Next up, well, turns out it's another issue of Adventures into the Unknown, because I screwed up. Yeah, my copy is coverless, but uh, I didn't realize it was another ACG book until just now. But that's okay, because this one is even nuttier than before. Case in point, it's the plant that lived. The Malacca flycatcher is considered by many to be the world's strangest plant. That's all well and good, but this story focuses on something called the Haitian vampire plant, which we're to believe is far stranger. Here's one now, with a helpful sign to keep people at bay. No guards or fencing. Hey, if we can't trust you in the botanical gardens, where can we trust you? The plant lashes out and snatches a little dog, but it's really after the tall blonde, who it manages to mind meld with. The plant wishes to become human, and, using Tony here as its pawn, plans to escape the garden. Later that night, Tony arrives, and under its spell, digs the thing up. Returning to her hotel, she sticks the little booger under a sun lamp, but the plant declares it is hungry for a different kind of food. In this case, rich and nutritious plasma, which, apparently, you can just buy without a prescription. Snag me a sixer, please. The plant really takes to its new diet, gaining in strength and magnifying its control over Tony. However, in the interest of maintaining normalcy, it allows its pawn to go out on a date, with hilarious results. Tony equates eating a salad to cannibalism, gets all touchy-feely with a shrub, and generally acts like an oddball. Boyfriend Phil, who also runs the botanical gardens, is contacted about the missing plant and wonders if there's a connection between this and Tony's odd behavior. He shows up at Tony's hotel and finds her grow room. However, before he can narc on her stash, the plant attacks Phil, who hurries off to find a cop. Why he didn't just call on the hotel phone? Well, to give old Sticky Icky here a chance to snag Tony and escape. Phil can't stop it in time, but manages to break a piece off, which he uses to determine the plant's weakness. The killer Bud has been robbing pharmacies for the life-giving chlorophyll it needs, so Phil engineers a shortage and sets up the final confrontation. After recruiting the help of the local constabulary, Phil manages to capture the wicked weed and, to use the common vernacular, fires one up. It ends the way these things usually do, with a funny smell in the air and our heroes heading off red-eyed to eat everything in sight. 
<laughs> Groovy, baby. The man who returned from Hades begins with a lover's quarrel in the office of the Jonesville Star. The paper's editor, Jane, is ragging on her boyfriend, Carrie, to make something of himself. This is an odd thing to say, as the guy's already a renowned sea diver, but Jane wants more. Carrie being Carrie tells Jane where to cram it, and off he goes on another exotic deep-sea diving expedition, this time into an inexplicably vast whirlpool. Aided by a state-of-the-art submersible, Carrie is drawn to the bottom of the ocean, to a vast underground chasm, and into the very maw of hell itself. Captured and imprisoned by devils, Carrie is brought to Satan, who sentences his latest guest to eternal torment in the lava pits. Unexpectedly, Carrie has the strength to resist. Having come to hell alive, he has the power of a mortal man, and he fights back long enough to learn of his hometown's imminent destruction. Ordered back to his cell, Carrie manages to escape to the devil's library, where a helpful tome allows him to return to the surface world. He appears to Jane, explains the mayor, is aware of the local dam's imminent failure, but doesn't care. Carrie abducts the mayor after the corrupt official refuses to send men to repair the damage. If the dam breaches, Carrie wants the mayor to be the first to suffer. Kind of weird that he brings his girlfriend along, but hey, he's the Satan-baiting seaman, not me. It looks like all is over, but then Carrie remembers those little words that say so much and commands an army of Satan's minions to repair the dam. The town is saved, the mayor flees, and Carrie and Jane head home to towel off. But the wet ain't done yet, as our final story of the issue focuses on an oceanographic expedition in the trackless wastes of the far Pacific. A large egg is brought up in an industrial dredger. Within moments, the egg hatches, revealing what appears to be a baby sea monkey. Man, when I sent in my two bucks, all I got was a packet of brine shrimp. Anyway, elated with their seeming good fortune, the sailors try and make a beeline for San Francisco, where apparently they go for this sort of thing. Before they can get away, the ship is boarded by a dozen full-grown mermen who demand the return of the child. After a bit of back and forth between the two parties, the captain agrees, and the baby is returned to its mother in a surprisingly touching moment. With the child returned, all seems like it's Jake, but these mermen really know how to hold a grudge and sink the ship for its perfidy. Yowza! We're going to wrap things up with a book that I've been waiting for a while to spring on you. Now, I don't have many pre-code horror comics because, even in crap condition, well, they're tough to find. That said, the sun shines on a dog's ass occasionally, and I have found a few over the years. This is a personal favorite from our friends over at Harvey Comics. Yes, that's right, years before they were cracking out safe publications like Richie Rich and Casper the Friendly Ghost, Harvey produced some truly ghoulish content. If you will, follow me now into The Tomb of Terror. In our first tale, Benny the Rat is a cheap hood on the run after crossing the mob. He heads down to the shipyard to slip away, but he's seen by one of his cronies as he tries to escape. Benny thinks he's safe in plain sight, but the mobster? He's a creative type. Instead of shooting Benny directly, he brings a crate dangling overhead down on his unwitting target. Judging from the rapidly spreading pool of blood, the indirect approach works just fine. This guy should consider teaching a course. And hey, it turns out it wasn't just any crate. This one contained a scientist's experimental formula for reanimating dead tissue. Oh, and a rat. That bit's both important and ironical, considering Benny's moniker and all. Here's Benny now, transformed as a result of his freak accident. Honestly, it's really kind of a lateral move for this guy. Instead of kvetching at this unexpected change of circumstance, Benny rolls with it, using his newfound rat abilities to avenge himself on his oppressors. Wow, look at him go! He's way more effective as a rat than a human being. And dig this macabre moment. Benny draws close to this beautiful dame, his rodential countenance conjuring up such fear that she's driven both mad and old.
<laughs> Quick, get Kate here a walker and an ARP card. Fully embracing his transformation, Benny begins a one-man, one-rat crime spree. He can now burrow into the earth, climb high walls, and change size? It's weird. Sometimes he's as big as a regular guy. Other times he's climbing out of tiny holes. I guess I shouldn't overthink it. <laughs> the writer certainly didn't. Meanwhile, Nails the Gangster has discovered what happened to his favorite mole and decides to get revenge on Benny. He tracks him to his subterranean lair and feeds Benny a line of bull about the town's mobsters all wanting the rat man to be their new capo. He also feeds Benny a nice steak seasoned liberally with rat poison. And while we're led to believe that this is the end for Benny, I like to think that he shook it off and is still out there somewhere, eating cheese and plotting his next move. Next up, it's Marriage of the Monsters. Well, they make a nice couple at least. So what's their story? Star-crossed lovers Ra and Lena's romance is doomed. Lena is the princess Petro to Tatka, who doesn't take kindly to another man rubbing his rhubarb. He mummifies Ra, then buries the lovers together, where they rest undisturbed for 3,000 years. Smash cut to today, where Dr. Mesner tries to convince his colleagues he's unlocked the secret of death. He's laughed off as a quack, and they mock his smelly vials. Wow, scientists can be really catty when they want to be. Mesner's theory is that all life comes from electrical energy, and he's determined to prove it by plugging a mummified Ra into a light socket. Three hours pass, and other than the room probably stinking up something awful, nothing much happens. He tosses Ra out as he stole a second mummy in case he needed a do-over. However, Mesner was hasty. It turns out his process was a success, and Ra has been revived. He returns to the lab just as Mesner manages to kickstart the second mummy. Taking the doctor for the descendant of the man who killed him, Ra drags the doctor beneath the powerful electrode, killing him and reducing Ra and his beloved to ash with nothing but two charred bony hands left to show that they'd ever been. In The Head of Medusa, four scientists get more than they bargain for when they go in search of the lost city of Ilium, the so-called Land of the Gods. Using a grenade, they blast into an ancient temple where they stumble upon the weird and wondrous form of the Medusa. The statue's effects are immediate, and the party flees back to the jungle in horror. Soon, one of the men transforms into a Medusa and sprints off with the party's token female, Viv. Tracking him down, the other two scientists blow their transformed comrade away and, shaken, attempt to return to their previous lives. One quickly goes mad and hangs himself, leaving only Steve and Viv. Soon, a hideous creature begins roaming the streets, biting people. Is that something Medusa do? and just generally making a nuisance of itself. Steve determines Viv is the Medusa and meets her at midnight. They go to Hugo's grave, but it's simply a pretense to get Viv to reveal herself. When she does, Steve dispatches her efficiently with a crowbar and then rushes back to his apartment, just in time to deliver us with the final snaky denouement. But dear God, whatever you do, do not look! Management cannot be held responsible for any Medusa transformations. Thank you. And finally, we conclude this chillifying episode with slime. Living slime. Oh yeah, baby. Slime was just one of those things back in the day. It was a generic monster not tied to any one specific property. Okay, sure, you had your blob, but that was kind of a one-off. I mean, for a start, that was red. We all know slime is bright neon green. I mean, Harvey knew it. Enough of my John. Let's sink in. Escaped con Merrill Dane runs deeper into the darkness of the Florida Everglades, the cops and their bloodhounds only moments behind. In spite of his desperate circumstances, Dane takes a moment to catch his breath. In the distance, he sees a numinous green pool. 
Before he can react, a tendril snaps out of the pool and captures a jackrabbit, pulling the poor creature to its demise. Just then, the bloodhounds appear. Dane runs, coming in contact with the slime, which imparts to him the speed of the recently digested rabbit, allowing the con to get away. Dane discovers a ramshackle dwelling, but before he can enter, an old man bursts out and makes him wipe the slime off. It seems the substance can be a source of remarkable power, but it always returns to claim its own. After a few days, Dane heads out. He starts a new life in a new town, but those old criminal ways come back to haunt him. He could really get ahead at work if only he could get rid of Jones, and get rid of Jones he does. The green slime kills Wade's co-worker, passing the man's fiscal brilliance onto Wade. Using this insight and knowledge, Wade is soon captain of industry, but he must have more. He summons the world's greatest living scientist, a top politician, and a military general to join him in the swamp and six the green slime on him. Unfortunately for Dane, he gets a bit of slime under a thumbnail, and before you can say, a splotch, a blotch, be careful of the blob, it's done eight, Dane. It quietly recedes into itself, content in the knowledge that sooner or later, another delicious convict will come along. And so we come to the end of another episode. For those of you who are outraged that I didn't get to an EC comic, <laughs> relax. There are many breakfasts yet to come, and the scariest things often appear at the most unexpected of times. If you enjoyed this breakfast, please like, share, and subscribe. If it really blew the doors off your tube, consider throwing a few bunks in the old guys who like old comics tip hat. We thank you. For the old guys who like old comics network, I'm Jason Mink. I'm wishing you a happy Halloween, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast. Thank you.